Hi, my name is Lydia and welcome to my channel. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I invite you to click subscribe and come back for more true crime stories. Hello to my returning subscribers. I am so happy to have you here. And you know the drill. I bet this video will export in low quality again. So again, I apologize for that. My sources for this true crime story are linked in the description box below. As always, I mean no disrespect to any of the persons mentioned, and it is always my intent to bring this story to you for educational purposes and to give a voice to the voiceless. Let's begin. Since I had a lot of work to do in my day job these last couple of weeks, my intention was to find a shorter story to bring to you so I could post a shorter video this time around. But I came across this case and I absolutely fell down the rabbit hole. I couldn't believe I had never heard of this story before. So if I haven't heard of it, perhaps you have not either, and that's why I'm bringing it to you today. There is a lot of information about these killers online, and unfortunately not a lot of information about their victims. And that is not what I like to do here. Here on this channel, I like to give you as much information as possible about the victims in a true crime case. And unfortunately, I have more information about the perpetrators this time. But this case is so interesting and it has so many twists and turns that it just grabbed me and it screamed at me that it must be told. The perpetrators in these crimes are truly frightening to me. They are the type of people that if I came across them in daily, day-to-day -day life, I am sure that I never would have seen the true killers that they were underneath their charming exteriors. I am more comfortable telling their story now because one of the killers is dead and the other one sits in prison for the rest of their life. This is the story of the killer mother and son duo, Sante Kimes and Kenny Kimes. I like to call her the queen of chaos. In fact, there are many C words that can be used to describe Sante Kimes. Chaos, control, charisma, confidence, calculating, con artist. The definition of a con artist is a person who cheats or tricks others by persuading them to believe something that is not true. The majority of con artists are psychopaths, although not all psychopaths develop into con artists. Each con artist is an expert manipulator and a shapeshifter. Sante and Kenny both fit the description of con artists, and they have also been called grifters. A grifter is a con artist. It is someone who swindles people out of money through fraud. And the difference between a grifter and a thief is that a grifter will trick you out of money through lies, while a thief takes it by force. Grifting, scamming, and conning are all forms of fraud. And fraud may as well have been Sante Kaim's middle name. There are conflicting sources as to the true history of Sante's childhood. In the 1990s, the media got wind of her story after her arrest, and it went with the most scandalous parts that they could find, of course. But after picking through all that was available online, this is what I believe to be true. Now, of course, I am not Sante's biographer, so please take this with a grain of salt. Sante was born as Sante Singers in 1934 in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. She was the third of four children born to Mary Van Horn, a Dutch woman from Illinois, and Prama Singers, an East Indian man who seemed to be a bit of a con artist himself. Mary met Prama when she saw him performing as a magician at a state fair. The two fell in love, married, and bought a farm in Oklahoma. Four children would follow, a son and three daughters. Soon after their youngest child was born, Prama died of heart disease which left Mary in a desperate situation, having to provide for four children in the Depression era. After the death of Prama, the family did indeed begin to fall apart. According to Sante's younger sister, their older brother was physically abusive to their mother, and he would steal from her, and eventually he would run away. Sante's older sister also ran away at some point, which left Sante, her younger sister, and their mother Mary. 
Sante's sister reported disturbing behavior that Sante exhibited in her youth. She said that Sante was abusive towards her, other younger children, she played with fire, and she liked to torture their farm animals by sticking pins in them and also clipping clothespins to their bodies. As veteran true crime followers that I know that you are, I know that you know that these are the classic signs of a psychopath in the making. But again, this is a shaky biography of Sante's youth, so take it with a grain of salt. Mary and her two daughters moved from Oklahoma to California, hoping to find a better life. Mary found work in a factory, and the three of them still continued to struggle to survive. Making things even more difficult, Sante's sister would report that Sante often flew into fits of rage when she wasn't getting what she wanted. The rages were so out of control that they frightened her mother into acquiescing most of the time. And Sante learned that if she fought hard enough and had a big enough tantrum, she would get what she wanted. In Los Angeles, Sante met a couple who owned a local theater. They were charmed by the little girl, and they thought that she just needed a little bit of a leg up in life. They introduced Sante to their sister, Mary Chambers, and her husband, Ed Chambers. They lived in Carson City, Nevada, and they wanted to adopt Sante. Both Sante and Sante's mother agreed to the adoption, and Sante moved to Carson City, Nevada. In Carson City, Sante had a more middle-class life. Both Ed and Mary worked hard, and they gave Sante and her adopted brother a good life. Sante changed her name to Sandy Chambers, and she adapted well in school. She made many friends, she was popular, and of course she was beautiful. But her mean streak did not go away, as classmates would later report that Sante was a bit of a bully and she would pick on children also. As I said, Sante was a beautiful girl, and I can picture her as a mean girl in school. Pretty, but vicious. But just being mean did not hold enough excitement for Sante, so she started to develop other deviant behaviors. Sante started to shoplift. She didn't need to shoplift. Her parents gave her more than enough money. But it was something that she enjoyed for the simple thrill of it. And when Sante got caught, and could use her charisma to get out of it, it only gave her the fuel to do it again and to do it more daringly. She had the desire to up her game and see what else she could get away with. Sante graduated from high school in 1952 and moved back to California with a friend. There she started college and she met a man who was also graduating college and he was about to enter the army. Sante had her eye on marrying him so she lied and told the man that she was pregnant, and they quickly got married. However, the marriage would not last, and they were divorced within a year. Sante moved on to a man named Ed Walker, who was an old high school friend who had always had a crush on Sante. They married within six months after her first marriage had ended. Sante was only 23 years old. Ed Walker was a successful contractor, and he built homes in the Sacramento area of California. The couple had enough money, and Sante had the stable home life that she had never had in her childhood. But it was not enough. It was not exciting enough for Sante, and I personally believe if she really was trying to have a normal life at this point. Perhaps she tried with her first marriage, found it not very exciting, and then she tried again with her second marriage, but she was just not happy with a normal life. I can imagine Sante just trying to be good, trying to fit in, be a good neighbor, be a good wife, but her natural deviant personality just couldn't contain itself. She was living a facade and she knew it. And once she let her true self break through and all bets were off, Sante just began living as she really wanted to. She thrived on chaos and found anything that did not rise to her level of excitement not satisfying. One way in which Sante wreaked chaos was setting fires to the houses that her husband Ed was building as a contractor. They would collect the insurance money afterward. Thus, Sante would see that she could not only gain excitement from the chaos and the destructive behavior that she wreaked, but she could also financially benefit from it as well. And just like her shoplifting from when she was a teenager, if Sante was charming and convincing enough, she could get away with it. 
At first, Ed Walker did not suspect Sante of setting the house fires, but as her chaotic behavior increased, he knew that his wife was out of control. Around this time, Sante changed her name from Sandy back to Sante, and she also began to have affairs. And she continued to shoplift and steal as well. She was becoming the woman she always wanted to be. Sante was a con artist. In the midst of all this early chaos, Sante and Ed had a son whom they named Kent. Sante enjoyed being a mother, and her son Kent would later say that she was a good mom and she always made life exciting and fun. Of course she did. Later he would say that what he saw as her charisma and her charm was really just a pretty cover for the monster that she was underneath, and soon he realized that as well. Sante was hungry for more and more and more, and she just wasn't satisfied with the good life that she had with her husband, the contractor. So she divorced Ed Walker and she went on a hunt for real wealth. Sante and her son Kent moved to Palm Springs, California, an area of great wealth, and she changed her persona and she changed her looks to match what she thought the millionaires would be looking for. She found her target in Kenneth Kimes, a millionaire real estate tycoon who owned a successful chain of motels. She had read about him in a magazine. Kenneth was divorced with older children and he was also 17 years older than Sante. He had no desire to get married again, but Sante had carefully studied her mark and she had made herself as irresistible as possible to Kenneth Kimes. She took up his hobbies, she liked what he liked, she got breast implants, she wore clothes that he liked, and she perfected her hair and makeup so much to the point that people often mistook her for Elizabeth Taylor. She was the fun, hard-drinking party girl that Kenneth Kimes could not resist. And after a year, her efforts were finally rewarded and Sante and Kent moved in with Kenneth Kimes. Four years later, however, they were still not married, so to cement her relationship to Kenneth, Sante decided to get pregnant. <music> Kenneth Kimes Jr., or Kenny as he was called, was born in 1975. Sante was 40 years old and Kenneth was 57. They moved with their sons, Kent and Kenny, to Hawaii to live a lavish lifestyle. Sante finally had all she wanted. She had the great wealth. She had a millionaire partner, but she still craved excitement. She still craved more and more chaos. It was never enough for her. Never. And Sante also craved control. One way in which Sante created control was in the actual physical control of hiring maids for her houses. Except the maids were not hired in a legal manner and they were not paid either. Sante would travel to Mexico and with her incredible charisma, entice and convince young women who were down on their luck and needing jobs to come to her homes in Hawaii to work for her. She convinced them that they would be living and working in paradise and in luxury and that they would be paid very well. But when they arrived in Hawaii, that was certainly not the case. The maids were forced to endure backbreaking work, they were not paid, and they were also not allowed to leave. Some of them were also beaten. Sante considered these maids her slaves. In 1979, the family moved back to the States, settling in Las Vegas, Nevada. Kent Walker, however, stayed behind in Hawaii. By then, he was 17 years old. Some of Sante's maids traveled to Las Vegas as well. Life continued as normal for Sante, Ken, and Kenny as they continued to live in the lavish lifestyle of luxury. But for the maids, they continued to be mistreated. And in 1985, one of them escaped and contacted the FBI. More maids were contacted, a case was made, and Kenneth and Sante Kimes were arrested and charged with involuntary servitude. It basically meant that it was a charge of slavery. Kenneth agreed to a plea bargain in which he admitted that he knew about the abuse of the maids and he only received probation. Which is shocking to me, really. I mean, he lived in the house. He knew what was going on. He supported Sante. 
He benefited from the slave labor for years and years, and all he received was probation, a slap on the wrist. It's disgusting, really. Kenneth Kimes was not an innocent man by far. He was not duped by Sante. He was an intelligent guy who knew what she was doing and knew what she was capable of. He actually admired her for the crazy stunts that she would pull, and he benefited from the things that she shoplifted and stole, even a car at one point. He may have been blinded by Sante's charm in the beginning, and originally he had been conned by her, but in the end, he knew who she was, and he continued to stay. Sante pled guilty to the slavery charges, and she was sentenced to five years in prison. State your full name for the record. Sante Kimes. All through my lifetime, how many maids have I had? Let's say, uh, since you were married to Mr. Kimes. Oh, gosh. I've never yelled loudly, or, and I have certainly never uh, physically touched any of them. This video is Sante Kimes in a 1988 deposition denying that she kept slaves. It was the first time that she had ever had to face real consequences for her actions, and this time she was not able to buy or charm her way out of a jam. Sante was in prison, and she was 52 years old. Sante wound up only serving three years in prison, and she was paroled in 1989. I've suffered brain concussion injuries. I've been incarcerated wrongly for three years. I've had the insurance carriers setting me up uh, in this unbelievable deposition, which is endangering my life, my freedom, our family. She vowed that she would never go back to prison again. Kenny was 11 years old when his mother went to prison, and for the first time in his life, he was out from under her suffocating control. Growing up in Hawaii, Kenny was the apple of his mother's eye. Sante had Kenny homeschooled by tutors, and she oversaw everything that he did. I think she saw a kindred spirit in Kenny, and she sought to mold him into becoming someone just like herself. Kenny was charming and good-looking, just like Sante, and he was mischievous and he lied very easily, just like Sante had in her youth. But when his mother was sent to prison, Kenny started to live a normal life, finally. His father put him in school, and for the first time, Kenny was in classes with other kids. He started seventh grade at a private Catholic school in Las Vegas. Kenny's classmates later described him as outgoing, likable, just a normal kid who liked getting attention. He went to football games and class parties, and his house became a place for he and his friends to hang out. He was thriving in school and at home. He had begun to be closer to his dad, and everything was going well for Kenny. He also visited his mother once a week in prison. But when Sante was released three years later and she had come back home, she was back fully in charge again, in charge of both Kenny and Kenneth Kimes. Sante forced Kenny to transfer schools and forced him to sever contact with all those friends that he had made in those three years while she was away. She saw that Kenny was becoming his own person and she did not like that at all. The family began moving from house to house, throwing the stability that Kenny had enjoyed while his mother was away in prison out the window. And soon, Kenny would find it just easier to submit to anything his charismatic con artist mother would have him do. Sante desired both chaos and control, and that's what Sante got. In 1993, Kenny broke free again, and he started attending college at the University of California in Santa Barbara. It was another opportunity for Kenny to get out from under his mother's control, but it did not last long. In March 1994, towards the end of Kenny's first year in college, Kenneth Kimes died of an aneurysm. He was 74 years old, and Sante was 59. Because of his father's death, Kenny left college and moved back home with his mother. But he and Sante would be dealt a huge dose of reality when they learned that Kenneth Kimes had not willed them a red cent in his will. He had left everything to his older children from his previous marriage. This not only infuriated Sante, but it compelled her to become creative in ways to make money and ensure that her lavish lifestyle would continue even after Kenneth's death. Sorry, I said that wrong. She would not be creative in ways to make money. 
she would become creative in ways to take money. Sante Kimes was a grifter through and through, and Kenny Kimes was a grifter in training. And tough times called for even more outrageous and more horrible behavior on the part of both of them. They needed to pull out their true con artist skills because they needed them now more than ever. Syed Alal Ahmed was from Bahrain. He worked as an auditor for Cayman Island Gulf Union Bank, and he had been sent to the Bahamas to audit one of the bank branches there, a branch that Kenneth Kimes had an overseas account in. In September 1996, Sante and Kenny Kimes traveled to the Bahamas to secretly attempt to withdraw money from Kenneth Kimes' overseas bank account. At the bank branch, Syed was introduced to Sante and Kenny Kimes by another bank employee. He was suspicious of their attempt to withdraw money from the account, but before he could report any illegal action or do anything more about it, the bank auditor was invited to dinner by Sante and Kenny Kimes. Later, other bank employees would report that the purpose of their dinner was so that the Kimes could offer advice to Syed, who wanted to rent a home in the Bahamas. The dinner was held at the Bahamas Cable Beach Hotel, and it would be the last time that Syed Ahmed would be ever seen in public again. Years later, Kenny would admit to killing Syed that night. He said that under the direction of his mother, they had brought Syed back to their Bahamas home and slipped a sedative in his drink. After Syed had slipped into unconsciousness, they had drowned him in a bathtub and then they had dumped his body offshore. I'm not quite sure of the purpose of Syed's death, although I imagine that Sante was afraid that if Syed had alerted the authorities as to the suspicious behavior at the bank, it would kind of be a domino effect. I'm sure that they were doing other illegal things at the time and Sante and Kenny would be caught for something. I wish I knew more about Syed as well. I believe it was a senseless murder because in later reports it would be told that Sante and Kenny had left the Bahamas without withdrawing a cent from the account anyway. They had murdered someone and not gained a thing. In fact, they had only gained suspicion from the police. In 1998, Sante Kimes returned to her old habit of arson. Even though Sante and Kenny no longer lived at the residence, a suspicious fire had occurred at the Kimes' house in Las Vegas in January 1998. It seems as if Sante was back to collecting insurance on fire-damaged homes. But it was not just a fire insurance con this time. Before the fire had occurred at the Kimes' house, the deed had been transferred from Sante to Kenneth and Sante Kimes' old real estate friend, David Kasdan. Born in 1934 in Brooklyn, New York City, David Kasdan was an old friend of Kenneth Kimes. After Ken Kimes had died, Sante had transferred the deed of her home to her old friend David, and then she took out a loan against the house. Sante pocketed all the loan money, but then the payment plan went directly to David. But the loan was not enough money for Sante. She wanted to burn down the house and collect that fire insurance money as well. But David Kasdan was on to Sante. He contacted her about the situation and allegedly threatened to contact the authorities about her scam. And shortly after their communication, David Kasdan's body was found in a dumpster near the Los Angeles airport in March 1998. David Kasdan was 63 years old. Later, Kenny would admit to killing David as well. He said that at the direction of his mother, he had entered David's home and he had shot him in the back of the head, later disposing of his body in the dumpster. At the time, police investigators were suspicious of Sante and Kenny Kimes of the murder of David Kasdan, but they had no direct evidence. They did not have enough to arrest either mother or son, but... Sante and Kenny Kimes were now fully on the radar of the police. But Sante Kimes was on to her next mark, and this time it would be very different. The first two murders that the mother and son committed were both in response to an event or a situation that either threatened their finances or their freedom. And those were two threats that Sante would not accept. No one was going to take away her lavish lifestyle and no one was going to put her back in prison, not if she could help it. She would do anything to prevent that, 
and it didn't matter who she had to force into helping her, even her own son. Syed Ahmed had discovered their intention of withdrawing money illegally from her husband's account. Syed was a threat and needed to be stopped. David Kasdan had discovered that he was being swindled into paying for a loan that Sante had benefited from. David was a threat and had to be stopped. This time, Sante and Kenny's mark was someone completely unrelated to their lives. She was a complete stranger. She had done nothing to either mother or son, and she was no threat to them at all. But Sante and Kenny saw an opportunity to take what she had, and they pounced on that opportunity. It would be their downfall. While on vacation in Florida, Sante and Kenny had met a woman who talked about her time renting an apartment from an elderly woman who owned a beautiful brownstone townhouse mansion in a wealthy area of New York City. The woman told Sante and Kenny to check it out whenever they were in New York City next. Sante was intrigued, and when she and her son arrived in New York City, they found it all to be true, and they wanted it for themselves. Their plan was to kill the owner of the building, assume her identity, and take over the $7 million estate. Described as a socialite and the wealthy widow of a real estate developer, Irene Silverman was so much more than that. Irene Zambelli was born in New Orleans in 1916. Her father was related to a famous ballet dancer, so dance was in Irene's bloodline. Her parents, though poor, made it a must that Irene would have ballet lessons. Unfortunately, Irene's father left the family, but mother and daughter moved to New York City where Irene would continue with her dance lessons. Irene was only five foot tall, so she was not accepted into a major ballet company. Instead, she was hired as a ballet dancer at Radio City Music Hall. She would perform with the other dancers every day for a weekly paycheck of $36. Irene was nicknamed Zambi, one because it was short for her last name of Zambelli and also because it rhymed with Bambi. Eight years into her dancing career, Irene met Samuel Silverman, a rich older real estate tycoon. They married when Irene was 25 years old. And although it was a marriage of convenience for the pair, they enjoyed each other's company and for the first time, Irene and her mother did not have to worry about money. When Irene was 57, her husband Samuel died of cancer, but life did not slow down for Irene. Friends would recall that she began taking college classes and that she was a hit with the other students. Not only did she carry around a bottle of champagne in her purse, but she also offered to drive the other students home from class in her limousine that she would take to class every day. Irene loved her life, she loved her friends, and she loved her boxer dogs that she bred at home. She dyed her hair a bright red color and she kept in ballerina shape. In 1998, at the age of 82, Irene Silverman was still a bright light in the New York City scene. However, it was in Irene's own home that she would meet her fate. Irene owned a six-story mansion in the Upper East Side of New York City, steps away from Central Park. She rented suites in the building to her friends and acquaintances, just because she enjoyed having people around her. Irene would welcome renters with good references. And when a tall, well-dressed man who called himself Manny Garing showed up with his rent payment in a stack of cash and with the name of one of Irene's old friends as a reference, Irene welcomed him into her home. Unfortunately, she had let in a wolf in sheep's clothing. Assuming the alias of Manny Garing, it was Kenny Kimes who had approached Irene to rent an apartment in her building. He was polite and charming, of course, and Irene agreed to rent him an apartment. However, when an older woman Manny referred to as his assistant moved in shortly afterward, Irene began to get suspicious of her new tenants. And in July 1998, Irene Silverman was reported missing. She was 82 years old. On July 2nd, 1998, three days before Irene Silverman was reported missing, Sante Kimes used false documents to attempt to get a deed transfer of the estate from Irene's name into her name. But it was too late. 
Sante and her son were already being pursued by the law for a completely unrelated reason. And after they were charged on that unrelated crime, they would also soon be considered persons of interest in the disappearance of Irene Silverman. At the same time as Sante and Kenny were executing the beginning stages of their plan to take over the $7 million mansion in New York City, Sante's movements were being tracked across country after she had purchased a car in Utah with a bad check. When authorities tracked down Sante for that fraud charge and found her in New York City, Sante was found to be carrying documents belonging to the missing woman, Irene Silverman. Meanwhile, Irene's other tenants had described to authorities a renter named Manny Garing, who had also disappeared around the same time as Irene. A police sketch was drawn, and the police had their first good lead in the missing persons case. Foul play was suspected. Soon afterward, the connection from Sante to Kenny to the police sketch to the mysterious renter was made. Both mother and son were arrested in connection with the disappearance and the suspected murder of Irene Silverman. Sante Kimes was 63 years old and Kenny was 23 years old. The media went wild for the case. A mother and son duo who had conned and frauded their way across the country, eventually landing in New York City, was scandalous news. The two were nicknamed Mommy and Clyde, and their story was plastered in newspapers throughout the U.S. And here is where it gets weird. Even while in jail, Sante made every effort she could to remain in the spotlight. It almost seemed as if she was trying to become famous, and for their case to be made so well known that it could be argued later that there was no way that they could ever have received a fair trial. In 1999, while Sante and Kenny Kimes sat in jail waiting for the trial of the murder of Irene Silverman to begin, a documentary entitled Public Enemy, Mother and Son aired, and it included clips of both Sante and Kenny, along with their lawyers, pleading with the public to not believe the allegations against them and to support them instead. If you believe in justice or family, I beg for your help. My son and I are innocent. There is a huge evil cover-up going on. The police have made a terrible mistake and are attempting to cover up what they have done to us. My son and I were arrested on July 5th, 1998 for a crime that we did not do. It included incredibly awkward clips of Kenny looking directly into the camera, close up, trying to convince the viewers that the two had been framed by the New York City Police Department. It's relaxed. Anyone have any vodka? Right now, more, Kenny. Okay. Just who you are. Hello. My name is Kenneth Kimes. You don't really know me. You may think you know me, but you do not. You may think you know my mother, but you don't. You have been led to think certain things about the both of us, which are completely untrue. We are innocent. And in another scene, Sante sat holding the hands of both of her lawyers, looking absolutely insane and insisting that the corrupt criminal system had misjudged both she and her beloved son. It is my great pleasure to introduce my beloved attorneys who are champions of justice and who I know will prove our innocence because we are innocent. This is Mel Sachs and this is Matthew Weissman who I dearly love. We will have other attorneys probably helping us. There's a tremendous interest. We have hundreds of attorneys that want to take this case because what this case is about is justice. So I know they will save my beloved son and I know that that if we just are given the rights to a fair trial, to a fair jury and a fair venue, that we will show the world the truth. Every effort Every, will be made yes, to make sure that a fair trial is given to you because that's what you 
and your son deserve the way any mother or any child deserves. And unfortunately, you've been mischaracterized and there's been a rush to judgment. And when the two were allowed to be interviewed together, or when they were permitted to sit next to each other in court, they would always hold hands and whisper to each other. They were still very much a bonded pair. We don't know where she is, but we pray for her. I pray with my son at 11 o'clock every night. We pray she's all right, but we don't know where she is. We're innocent, and if just given our rights, we will prove it. When I held my son in my arms when he was a child, <laughs> I used to believe in this country. I don't believe in this country anymore. Americans are endangered. Trust me, it can happen to you. It can happen to your mother. It could happen to your son. We have done nothing wrong. The police overreacted. They are framing us. I'm mostly fighting for my son because he is my son and he's wonderful. But I'm also fighting for your son and your family. My son is a wonderful young man. He is full of goodness. He is, he is just starting his life. He is, he, his background speaks for itself. Please, please be fair. This case needs your attention and your scrutiny. I ask you, wherever you are in the world, to please carefully scrutinize these proceedings and analyze the deterioration of law and justice in America. Sante still held sway over her son. It was still Sante and Kenny together against the world. We are innocent. Thank you for your time and may God be with you. <sighs> to my family and my friends, I miss you all terribly and I love you. I love you, Mom. Thank you. This is a fine young man with good character, with a heart. He's somebody who is deserving of fairness. He's been so wrongfully portrayed, and it's important for all those in the world to know who he actually is as opposed to prejudging him. And unfortunately, he has been prejudged, and he has already been viewed as a criminal, and he's not a criminal. Although Irene Silverman's body was never found, there was still enough strong circumstantial evidence to convince a jury that Sante and Kenny Kimes had committed the murder. In May 2000, both mother and son were found guilty of second-degree murder, and they were each sentenced to 120 years in prison. Two months later, both Sante and Kenny appeared on Larry King Live, during which they were interviewed separately from prison by Larry. Why you? Okay. All right, why are they going to pick? Why you and your son? I mean, they have a missing lady who's quite aged, yes. right? Yes. Why you? Because we just happened to be there at the apartment and they made the worst mistake in history that's what in england they're labeling it the worst unjust mistake in the history of the united states well, who's labeling it? well when they did the documentary they did one before i mean there is no crime there's no body there's no evidence well because there's nobody doesn't mean it wasn't a crime no but what <clears throat> i'm saying to you is that like like uh, our investigators will tell you we they tried they they they, they, they we, everyone looked that does not mean that, that, that they don't know the truth. For instance, I'd, I'd just like to show you something. That apartment purchase was legitimate, and it can be proven that it's legitimate. You purchased it? it? No. What did the prosecutor say was your motive? Uh, they, I think they believe it was money. Again, Sante raved and ranted, begging Larry and the viewers to read the transcripts from the court case. Just read them, she said. The judge, to me, is really the worst the worst uh, uh, guilty person in all of this. If that's true, you have an obviously successful appeal. Oh, it's on the record. I beg you, I beg the world to read the record. She insisted that it would be obvious that the two of them were framed just by simply reading the transcripts. This case is blown up and it's there's a witch hunt. A, there's a cloud over you. Yes. There's, but, that's but following there's, you around like eagle beagle. There's justice that's coming. 
You cannot convict someone for 125 years when there's no crime. The, the truth is in the records. Do you think Read you, the records. I will. Do you think you know who murdered that gentleman in Los Angeles, Mr. Kasten? I can, the reason I would love to talk about this, but I've been told that it will, you know, that everything has been so unfair that it will, uh, until we go to trial, it will hurt uh, my case. It was the masterful act of a true con. Sante knew that the television viewers would never go to the great length of finding the court transcripts and reading through all of them. She banked on the fact that she could merely convince the viewer through the strength of her denials and her pleas that yes, surely there must have been something that misled the jury. Surely this woman who was so convincing on TV had to be innocent. It's like a witch hunt. But the one good thing about that unfair trial, that unfair judge, and, the, and two years of nothing but that un, an unparalleled me, media lie, like a big Hitler lie, they won. They, they, they lied so much that people believed it. Jury it was, was out three days, though, right? The jury, I feel sorry for the jury. If I'd been in the jury, I'd have convicted me. Let me tell you about Kenny. The only reason I think I'm alive is that I must prove his innocence. Being a parent is the most important thing in the world, and that boy, is as innocent and as wonderful a son as you could ever pray for. He is in hell. He has done nothing wrong. And I will, I will spend my last breath praying for the public to free my innocent son. He's done nothing to fight this corrupt system and to bring out the truth. And Larry, you gave me your word and I've always been one of your fans, that you will read those transcripts. I'm going to read every information. you do, you're you going to see that not only did... But if I'm reading the same thing the jury had, and you said if you were on the jury, you'd have convicted, what am I going to learn? But you see, when you read it, you're going to see that the jury never got the chance for me to take the stand, never heard the truth. As a mother... I will fight for my son. I believe that if the American people read those transcripts and see the truth, that they will be outraged. Thank Do you, you know, Sante. I gotta run. God bless you and thank you. Please yourself. help us. Years after the trial, even Sante's lawyers would admit that Sante Kimes was an amazing liar. So you had a good life. Yeah, I did. So my gosh, to have all this come around you must be mind-boggling to you. It's it's difficult. Yeah, unless it's unfair. you did something wrong, and then it's terrible. I mean, then you're just, you know, getting away with something. But why would you do this? Oh, well, Larry, I don't think that's a fair interjection. It's, no. it's I, I did not do this. I did not commit this crime. I was arrested at the Hilton. There were no eyewitnesses. There was no physical evidence. I have no motive to commit this. I'm trying to Larry, figure out what was your motive. What was the motive the prosecution believed? I think that would be... They and believed they were in it. Yeah, they, they, they said game. that we wanted to, to rob the house. They said we wanted to steal the mansion. For the love of God, how do you steal a mansion? Like they're trying to say that my mom broke out of jail. We we'll tried to break out of jail. Yeah, we forgot to ask her about it. A 65, yeah, well, I'll, I'll bring it up for you then, Larry. Look. How did you plan this? You know why they did that? They did that because I was seeing my attorneys and and they don't want us to see them. They don't want us to have counsel visits. They don't even want us to have the even access is, to you. The they is who? Is the judge and the DA and, and whoever other entities. Why didn't you testify? Why didn't I testify? Because I thought my mom was going to have a shot at testifying on her own. But when she didn't, why didn't you? You want to, well, why didn't I? No, the jury would have been able to see you. Never. It's, it was too late. At that point, there, would, there was not a chance. So you knew you were a dead duck. I didn't know I was a dead duck, but I knew the judge was out to get us. I knew that, that, that my attorney wasn't able to bring out the issues. Are you gonna... Not that he didn't try. He tried, but the judge wouldn't let you him. You think you're going to win on appeal? Yes, absolutely. However, it was too little, too late. This time, Sante could not charm or lie her way out of trouble, and neither could she buy her way out of it. Sante and her son were going to prison for a long time. However, first, the state of California wanted their piece of Sante and Kenny Kimes as well. Their extradition back to California from New York State was being scheduled, where the two would face a trial in the murder of David Kasdan, which was still under investigation at the time. A murder trial in California would mean the possibility of facing the death penalty for both Sante and Kenny Kimes. And that very real possibility triggered a act of desperation on the part of Kenny. 
In October 2000, Court TV was sent to interview Kenny Kimes in his New York City jail cell. During the interview, Kenny grabbed one of the show's producers and holding a pen to her throat, he held her hostage for four long hours. The hostage situation ended only when prison staff were able to physically wrestle Kenny away from the producer, and thankfully the producer was unharmed. Um, if I may ask, uh, can we take a break in maybe five or ten minutes? Um, how about two minutes? Sure. Better. What do you need a break for? Oh, just a little, put a little water on my face. Just moments after the camera was turned off, Kimes took Zone hostage. <laughs> Kimes was holding this pen to Zone's throat. But Kenny's act of desperation, as he surely knew it would, made no difference in the end. The two were extradited back to California in June 2001. Back in California, Kenny Kimes decided that he was done. To avoid the death penalty, he confessed to the murders of all three, Syed Ahmed, David Kasdan, and Irene Silverman. He reported that his mother had used a stun gun on Irene while she slept and that he had then strangled her and then he had left her body in a dumpster in Hoboken, New Jersey. Her body was never found. He also described the events surrounding the murders of Syed Ahmed and David Kasdan, and in exchange for his testimony, Kenny Kimes was spared the death penalty. But Sante would not do the same. She insisted that both she and her son were completely innocent and that Kenny had merely made a false confession to avoid the death penalty. Sante's trial went on as scheduled with her own son testifying against her in court. Because of his testimony, Sante was also spared death and she received an additional life sentence. Sante was sent to prison in New York to serve out her life sentence, while Kenny Kimes remained in California to serve out his. Now the entire span of the continental United States would separate the once inseparable pair. Mommy and Clyde were no more. But the story doesn't end there. In February 2011, a Facebook page appeared titled Sante Kimes Public Figure. On the page, which is still posted today, it features photos of Sante Kimes and links to all the various news stories about her case. It also features news of Sante's various legal disputes within the prison system. It appears Sante still had ample access to money in which to hire lawyers to dispute several different matters. In one matter, she complained that she had been held way too long in solitary confinement. And in another matter, she complained that she had been denied special services under the American with Disabilities Act. Apparently, at some point after her incarceration, Sante Kimes had been diagnosed as deaf. And the Facebook page also even included a link to an eBay listing where a pair of Sante Kimes eyeglasses were being sold. In March 2011, the first video was posted on the Sante Kimes YouTube channel. It is a two minute video delicately produced, bringing awareness to the Kimes Foundation for the wrongfully convicted. In 2011, a change.org petition also appeared online. It was started by the Kimes Foundation for the Wrongfully Convicted, and it was a petition for a new trial for Sante and Kenny Kimes. The text of the petition claimed that mother and son had been wrongfully convicted for the murder of Irene Silverman and that no physical or forensic proof had been presented at trial that the two were ever connected to Irene's death. 
The petition was archived on the change.org website, where you can view it even now. It was closed in the same year of 2011, and it had 58 supporters. Three years later, in May 2014, Sante Kimes died in prison. I don't know how she died, and frankly, I do not care. In November 2018, an article appeared online. It was a story told by Kenny Kimes to an author, and it was titled, My Mother Taught Me to Kill. In the essay, Kenny admits to and describes his participation in the murders of Syed Ahmed, David Kasdan, and Irene Silverman. He writes that everything he had done was under the direction of his mother, and now that his mother had passed away, he was finally free to tell his side of the story. I'm not sure I believe him. Kenny's essay reminds me of one of the clips I saw in one of the documentaries about their case online. In the documentary, Kenny's childhood tutor describes an event in which she read to Kenny the Aesop's fable about the boy who cried wolf. The story, of course, is about a shepherd boy who yells to the townspeople that he has seen a wolf attacking his sheep. And each time he cries wolf, the townspeople come running. And each time there is no wolf, the boy had been lying. And then when there is a real wolf attacking his sheep, and it is true, and the boy cries wolf again, the townspeople do not come. The boy's constant lying had made him unbelievable. And when young Kenny had heard this story from his tutor, he had run to his mom to tell her all about it. The tutor recalls how angry Sante had become. She had stormed right back to the tutor and she had told her that she, only she, Sante, would teach Kenny about morals. That sometimes there was a reason to lie. There was a time to lie and there was a time to tell the truth. And only she would teach Kenny the difference. And I can't think of a worse teacher on morals or truth than Sante Kimes. I feel sympathy for the young Kenny Kimes in that situation, but I do not feel sorry for the adult that Kenny became. So I turn this over to you now. I would love to hear what you think about this case, so please, please tell me about it in the comments below. Fall down the rabbit hole with me. There are plenty of videos to watch online. As always, thank you for your time in watching this video. I know your time is valuable, and I am so glad that you chose to spend some of it watching this video with me. If you liked the story, please consider clicking like, and if you really liked it, please consider clicking subscribe and coming back for more true crime stories. It was my honor to tell you the stories of the victims of these horrible crimes. May their memory be a blessing to all who knew them and loved them. And until next time, everyone, please, please take care, stay away from con artists and grifters, and just stay safe out there. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.